Um, good evening, everybody. Um, this is this is Nick Donnelly, um, uh, CMO founder of Commonwealth Bar Soccer TV, and I am here with uh, I'm here with Diego Lot, and I'm here with Mr. James Lot, um, his dad, and then we're actually going to just be discussing today. Um, obviously, we're going to discuss Diego's kind of career and and just also some of the um, the, the development journey he's on. Um, as an aspiring footballer, um, obviously had a lot of experience. So we're just going to speak. Um, we're kind of just going to speak um, about his career so far, and obviously his journey to to into America and to play college soccer, um, and then also um, also the educational side and look at his background. See, we make some tick, understand from his dad, and I think it's great for for a lot of parents out there to understand that also. Um, so first, first of all, I want to welcome you, um, James, uh, Mr. Mr. Lauder, James. What, 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 which one do you prefer? James is fine. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you for inviting us. It's great to be here. No, absolutely. Oh, it's, it's great to have you. You know, wonderful. Um, and um, and uh, just just want to kind of start off um, with you, James. And what what kind of was um, for you? Um, just kind of take us back, um, kind of. Kind of going through um, Diego's um, journey, um, and kind of what was kind of the first thing for you, um, you know, as a as a as a kid that was very active, kid that wanted to play football. How did that kind of start? Take take us kind of through your your journey there as as a dad. Mm, how how far do we go back now? How much can I embarrass Jago here? So, uh, <laughs> um, like most little boys, I'm going to play for England, you know, and you. Right. You know, great, well done, son. You know, even at times we were dragging him to the football field to play when he was really young, and I don't want to be here. Um, but very quickly, he, he had developed a determination, and I can remember two particular conversations, which might, uh, this is primary school age, that might uh, give an idea. So I remember one conversation with. Um, other parents on the pitch saying lots of parents here are really competitive the boys are really competitive and it's not it's not helping my my son doesn't enjoy coming to play football and Mm -hmm. and I had to say to them well I my son comes home every day in tears because he every time after training in tears because he has to play with people that don't know which way to kick the ball so it's not just the competitive it's not me being competitive it's also the boys that really want to push on. And that was, that was, that was one kind of, one little story. Um, and I think the next story was, was talking to some parents later on in primary school. And Jago was just Jago being Jago, talking about what he can do. And probably, you know, a thousand keepy uppies. He got to a thousand keepy uppies when you were nine, was it? Or 10 before your 10th birthday? I oh. Wow. And, you know, I don't know about you, Nick, but I've never even counted to a thousand, let alone done a thousand keepy uppies at the same time. And I was talking to some parents about it, and they were actually complaining to me that Jago was kind of bragging about what he did. And I said, Jago sets his alarm at six o'clock every morning, and he does an hour and a half training before he has breakfast. What's your boy doing before school? You know, and and this isn't being driven by us. It was never driven by us. You've got a really determined lad that, that has got, everywhere he's got has been because he's put in more effort than anyone else was was prepared to do right right and uh Diego what would you say what would you say that was kind of like just piggybacking off what your dad done so kind of as as a as a kid um the determine is did you feel like you needed to work harder than everyone else would you what would you um, say um i think as a kid like as a young young kid originally it was just I just enjoyed playing football and that was that was the most important thing is like it's not really working hard if you just enjoy playing it and then crucially I met a coach uh, at Southampton Academy called Brad Andrews who um, probably when I was about 10 dad was it yeah. or younger yeah. maybe younger and, uh, than nine, yeah. and he's he introduced me I read a book by um, Matthew Saeed called Bounce when I was like nine years old and it said that and we, or, or we listened to it on a audio tape I think going to wasn't it dad going on holiday and he basically said that if you want to be an expert in anything you have to do a thousand hours of practice over a 10 year span and I was just like I just remember thinking 10,000 10, hours 
No, but a thousand every year for yeah. ten years. Yeah. Um, and, he, and I just remember thinking, that's like what a tiny trade that is. What a, how worth it is that to just be a footballer and like not sit and do an office job and just be a footballer and get paid to do it. Mm-hmm. So it, it just came from just basically that and just seeing how how I, it just felt simple to me. If you did, if you played more football, you would make it as a footballer. Like, seems like the best thing deal ever to me at that age and now. So, yeah. So you see, you believe your mentality is still the same. Your goal yeah, is do. still, you know, yeah. I'm still dedicated. My dedication hasn't changed. Things like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and so, um, James, if you kind of take us through, so kind of, so whenever he was going through this, when did it kind of change and kind of going from being in grassroots to going to a professional club. Uh, take us through that journey from, from your perspective. Well, so some of these things are often, you know, it's serendipity. It's luck in some way. We moved from Bristol out to the countryside and south of Bristol. And it happened that in the village was a guy who was an author that wrote books about football clubs. And he took the village football team and he ran the, the, the village school football team and he recognised something in Jago and he knew a, a chap, Dave Hedges, who was connected with Southampton and suggested, come and have a look at this lad. I think he's, he's got some potential. Um, Dave had a look at him and then came to, to my wife, Jo, and myself and said, we'd like to invite Jago along to one of the feeders to the to the Southampton Academy and um, I remember taking Jago along and there was about 60 boys there and he said stop everyone stop um, this is Jago he's joining us now everyone watch Jago because he's going places like Jago just turned up for the first time he's right, okay. to play. Uh, Jago was the worst player there by a long way I, I don't understand how this works I'm not a footballer um, he he was de- he was he was a second behind everything. He wasn't moving fast enough. He wasn't he, you know he he wasn't reacting quick enough. He'd not played in that speed of football obviously before. But it was amazing how quickly he then he graduated out of that part of the academy and then into the next stage and into the next stage and then joined Southampton into the academy really quickly. So whatever you do as as football coaches and things, they see something that that non footballers. Definitely. And, you know, and I was just a parent going along with it. So your, so your position as a parent, James, what, what would your advice be to parents if, if their kids are going to make it? What do you think is an important aspect in terms of the role of a parent versus the role of the club? What, what would you explain that dynamic on, on what your kind of thoughts are uh, based on your experiences? It's an incredibly difficult role. As the parent here, no question. You, Why? Why would you say that is? You always want the best for your child. Don't you know? That's just natural. You want the best for your child, and you want them to follow their dream. Clearly, the dream that they are following, there is a lot of people that are shed on the way. There's a lot of cannon fodder in there that are there to make up the numbers so that the quite rightly the great players can float to the top and and that's that's clear you know what what is it 10 20 percent of people will make it in some level within the professional game and the rest don't so you've constantly got this this battle between education and what else might you be want, able to do and what what you're following your son's dream or the daughter's dream or any sport I guess it's going to be the same following along with them. So there's that constant battle. There's also the relationship with the club feels very, you feel quite powerless in that relationship. So if you were to say something wrong or something out of turn, would that in some way upset? You always feel precarious in the situation because, right. because your son is constantly on trial. It's, con- it's like permanently being in The Apprentice. You know, they're constantly being looked at, etc. Right. And, and it's, you know, I, when, when Jago was playing, playing uh, 
non-academy football i could really enjoy that there were very few right. games watching jago play in academy football that i could actually relax and enjoy um and those i remember very well um it's also quite interesting being on a parent the 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 parent relationships on the sideline because actually your boys are also in competition with each other right so it's you know so it's like the parents as well <laughs> to make your best to meet your best friend yeah. on the sideline of an academy right that you don't want to do that because they're competing with each other as well so they were quite kind of often very solitary kind of environments to go and actually then go and watch these academy games as well particularly for somebody like myself i'm not a footballer at all i I'm absolutely, right. don't know where this came from i am not a footballer so i can't even comment about how bad the ref is because i don't really get i don't really know that um and then finally the c kind of commitment that it then had we jago is the oldest of four children there is no you know when when you're getting up at six o'clock in the morning on a on a sunday and you're getting back at six o'clock in the evening and jago's played in london We've been up on the right. coach, you know, that's three kids that have not had your time for the rest of the day. Right. What you right. Up, yeah, that's very important. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. In order for one of your children to be able to have to follow their dream is a significant thing. And that and that and you were aware of that and that, you know, then that, then you've got to compensate in some way with the other children as well. So, right. you know, that, that's not an easy one. So, oh. That take, takes a very gloomy picture, I seem to be be painting. You know, at the same. No, time, I think it's a very real picture. Yeah. yeah, right. I'm incredibly proud of what Jago has achieved. Um, the people, not all, but but a lot of the people that we met at Southampton that were involved in Southampton were fantastic. And then when he moved to Bristol City, similarly, great people there. And I know that I could still pick up the phone to the academy manager at Bristol City at any time and. Um, have a great conversation about Jago or about other things as we have done. So, so there are oh, some great people brilliant. within yeah. that set up as well. So, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have not had that journey at all, but mm. go into it with your eyes open. Absolutely. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And what would your, so your, what would your number bits of advice you would give to a parent? Who has who has other kids in their family, and they've got a kid very very gifted, and that's kind of he's very he's very I suppose bent on conquest in that direction. What what advice would you would you give James? What would be your that they should really consider? I don't know that I have any amazing words of wisdom. In the same way, it's it's really hard to suggest how somebody parents their own children. Right. I would be. I would be very, very conscious of the impact it's going to have on your other children. Right. When you bring it to this. And as the success happens, and then they get more and more involved in it, so more and more time is, is um, uh, you, you're putting into one child rather than the other. So right. be really conscious of that and make conscious effort to do something with the other children. The other thing is to, you know, we with Jago and it was you know, you know at Southampton a large number of the boys were only children which was really interesting so the parents were able to dedicate the whole time we gave Jago response you know this was driven by Jago this was J Jago's dream if Jago ever didn't want this then we weren't pushing him it wasn't us pushing him it was Jago leading it all to the level where you know J at quite an late age some boys their parents would run on and do their shoelaces up you know these boys had did right, nothing yeah. for themselves whereas jago had to if he turned up without any boots that was his fault and he wouldn't do right. it again you know that's not our responsibility to pack i've got other right. children i'll be there with Correct. you i have to right. you do everything else you do the training right. as soon as he was old enough he got on the bus and it took him an hour and a half to get to the training ground on, on the bus and he had to do what was it bus train walk or bus train bus or whatever you did jago bus train walk. he did that you know and on occasion he rang me up and dad i'm on the wrong train heading towards cardiff <laughs> just like i suggest you get off <laughs> go the other way <laughs> Academy manager, Jago's gonna be a bit late you know and 
You know, that said a lot about Jago to the academy. You know, this guy's not being driven right. and popped up and, or by the parents. He's there on his right. own will. And, it, and if you are right. finally, then that's it. And I think that's important. You're taking responsibility early for your dream. Yeah. So you think you think football really provides you where parents can actually use it as a great tool to help them in parenting a child that has to grow up if he's going to come in if he's going to come into this industry. Yeah. If if they allow that to happen, you know. And right. and Jago mentioned Brad. Brad Andrews earlier as well. The other great thing that Brad said to, to Jago was, Jago, what, so what club do you want to join, Jago? This is age nine. What club do you want to? I want to play for Barcelona. Brilliant, Jago. Brilliant. So, so if you want to play for Barcelona, Jago, and so one, uh, so there's two players in your position going for a position at Barcelona. One speaks Spanish and the other one doesn't. Which one do you think they're going to pick? If they're absolutely the same, which one would they pick? Will they pick the one that speaks Spanish? So what are you going to do about that? Well, I'm going to learn Spanish. Jago now speaks Spanish. You know that? Well, not I, very well. Actually. Yeah, okay. You're a bit rusty, but you speak Spanish. Uh -huh. uh, um, yeah, so that, that's where it can be really used as a force for good. You know, yeah. to really drive, drive, to create a whole person. And, Absolutely. And, and that is the thing within it as well, isn't it? So... As soon as you've got somebody's passion, then what else can you bolt around it? Because it just becomes part of the same package to right. lift them up and drive them forward. And so it really can be, and that's perhaps a whole nother story talking about the education, but, but it really can be a way to drive forward people's educational achievements at the same time. Yeah, no, I, I would definitely, yeah, I think that's a really good point. So, Jay, when you look at, like, your dad's kind of explaining it from his from his perspective, what was kind of your perspective in terms of knowing what you had to do? Um, in you, Because it's kind of you at the end of the day. And the fact that you're aware that your dad was kind of putting, he was kind of prioritizing you in a way that, to help you. And um, what, would, what was kind of your understanding of that and going to Southampton? Um, and going through that journey, what what kind of can you kind of recall? Well, it's, it's interesting that. hearing it from Dad's perspective, especially from the Southampton because I was so young that I don't I don't remember it as well, mm. like the little intricacies. Um, but what I would say is I definitely appreciated Dad and Mum, like my parents, not living my dream vicariously. Because I think a lot of parents, especially in academies, and especially the dads, had a dream of making it pro. And now they didn't make it for whatever reason. And then they just pushed their, their child, their, their, their son. And, you know, that, there was a lot of people, dad, that, you know, their dad wouldn't speak to them afterwards mm. if they didn't, you know, like, score a goal or they gave the ball away or whatever. And dad was never like that. Mum and dad were right. never like that. It was completely my thing. And I can't, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, right. it, or my dream was that they were like that because, um, and I remember often um, other players would say to me, like, blimey, like, you're committed. Because I'd get on, I, I can't remember when I started getting the bus and the train, but from a young age, and a lot of my teammates and never even got the bus and the train by themselves and i was doing it 14 three times a week to get to training 14, yeah right yeah right. three times a week to get to training just because just because like that's why i just always did what i want what i got had to do to make it as a pro because it, it just sounds so much better than doing an office job to me <laughs> yeah no absolutely man you want to do you want to you never you want to do it because it's fun you know that's kind of yeah. why you didn't. Football is a privilege. I always tell people it's a privilege. It's not a right, you know. Um, yeah, very, very important. You can never take it for granted <laughs> either. I don't, also, I want to say what Dad was saying about the parenting. Yeah. I think from my perspective, academies are good because I've had, like, different coaches all the way up from when I was very young. And those different coaches have also provided, like, um, like role models for me as well like as as people um so like brad andrews especially was like he sticks out to me because he has a big influence on my life he probably doesn't know i haven't spoke to him in eight years or something but um mm -hmm. 
like it gave I wouldn't have had it otherwise the the, the role model was for how you live your life as well as also how you become a pro so I think that that, that right. was really good for me as well yeah, and and I think I think that um, when you're kind of going through that journey, um, I think it's it's the it's the things that you're doing, and I think what parents do to to sacrifice for their kids, um, I can definitely uh, I can definitely relate to that. Do you know what I mean? I'm bigger than my parent now, but but it's it's definitely important when you see parents that are empowering their children, and they're allowing their kids to go off and make mistakes. And I remember yeah. I remember one of the things Johan Cruyff said to me. He said, Nick. You have put people that bash players for no reason, but but he said the greatest thing about development it should be allowed and people should be allowed to make mistakes along the way, without being criticised um, because it actually slows down their their learning patterns if you bash them. And he said I always assume people and even even as a coach out there he says I've always assumed people will always make a mistake always and um, yeah. and that's okay <laughs> that's okay yeah. you know what I mean. Um, but um, I think that, um, and I, I believe um, definitely, I mean, a comment on Spar Shock, that's what we do with a lot of the players that kind of come through. We, we Our goal is, to, if they have an appointment, we impart them just like what your dad's saying, because you have to prepare them the world they're going into. Um, and I think that's the responsible thing to do. Because once you start muddy cuddling them, and the same thing's happening with my daughter at the minute, she's trying to become an actress. And I've said to her, there's going to be loads of people competing with you. And I said, I said, well, you think you're the only actress on the block. <laughs> That's not reality, you know, <laughs> at the end of the day. Very competitive industry. It's just like football, no different. And um, and I think it's it's great when you're aware. You've got great awareness of, of, the, of that. That's actually that's actually what's actually going on. Um, and so in, in terms of so as you kind of as you kind of go, um, 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 Diego, so you obviously um, you obviously you had other interests, didn't you, outside of football as well, right? So, yes. so you're yes. kind of thriving. Tell us, tell us, t just to kind of tell everybody, because I think it would be great, because I was quite surprised when your dad shared it with me, and I think it would be great if you share it with our audience. Yeah, so when I was 16, I did, uh, I was in Romeo and Juliet. Um, I was Benvolio in Romeo and Juliet. I always, I for some reason, I really took to, when I studied Romeo and Juliet, I just really enjoyed it and um, enjoyed learning about it. And then I, I'd always liked acting. But obviously, hadn't been able to do it that much because of um, football. But it, the opportunity came up, and uh, I took it and um, really enjoyed it. Just completely something completely different. I didn't really have the pressure of uh, academy as well, which I think I enjoyed as well. Um, and I think, especially at that time, I needed something else because I'd been in. I think football had got quite a lot for me at that point and I needed something else so I, I did I really enjoyed it and um, performed it over three nights every night um, blockbuster <laughs> <laughs> blockbuster <laughs> and yeah. so 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 is it kind of like did you like it because it was like I'm doing something different I'm kind of challenging myself and I'm really using so you really like the arts isn't it you like the entertainment yeah. industry as yeah, a, yeah, yeah. Would I be right in saying that? Yeah, yeah, I do. I love music. I love, you know, film and stuff. But also, I liked it because I met just completely different people. Like right. you know, you know yourself, Nick, that right. the people that are in acting are not the same people that are in, they're in football. And it was nice to just meet and hang around with like different people. Well, I, 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 yeah, I enjoyed it. You know, you know when you're saying that, it's so funny because I was telling my wife this recently, and your dad will kind of he'll definitely appreciate. It. When I was in the lyric theater as a kid, um, and it was very popular, especially during the Troubles, um, growing up in Northern Ireland, and and I remember when I went to play football, you know, a lot of the actors didn't like me <laughs> when I because I was yeah. going to go to like a it was like an event that was supposed to be run like just before COVID, and the, you all come together and then um, literally and then the alumni kind of there's like a performance at the lyric so people that have yeah. come through from when they were kids and then they do and then you come and look at performances and then there's drinks and things like that afterwards and and they were like you know i was thinking yeah but when i went back and it was a bit like jimmy dornan who's to back and then they said because he went off to the all-star academy you know 
to play rugby. Yeah. And so, and then I was obviously, yeah. I was obviously playing at Manchester United. So there was, there was a big thing where they wouldn't speak to us anymore because they viewed us, we're not like them anymore. We, we're, we think we're better and, and actors just don't like footballers in general. It's kind of a, yeah. it's kind of funny, you know what I mean? But, but yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's, you're right. Like it's a very different culture when you're in yeah. the acting arena and it's very artsy and they're very geeky, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I, I like that part of it. Yeah. That, that bit didn't bother me. I could switch my personality based upon the environment I was in. I'm sure, would, would you say it was the same for you? You could yeah. switch between? And, and actually, I think uh, probably my personality is more suited, or it was, I've, I've learned now, but it was naturally, it's probably more suited to um, those sort of people, actually in, in, in drama rather than football. And actually... That's one of the things I've really learned from being in football, that you do need to um, be a bit tougher and a bit more um, stand up for yourself more. And it's only since being released twice that I've learned that, really. I think more right. naturally, I, I'm more of a, a happy to be social. and um, Obviously, footballers are very social, but um, I think I just fit, naturally I fitted in more with that crowd, which is interesting in some ways. Mm, mm. And yeah. so if we just kind of look at that, because uh, that's kind of interesting what you just brought up. So, James, um, take us back to, so obviously you've been on this journey now, you're, you're gaining experience, you're learning what, about what it's all about. What, what, what was it like in, in terms of him being released? Take us through that experience for you as a dad. Mm. So when he was released from Southampton, it was the th almost that whole season leading up to being released, but particularly the last few months were very difficult. Mm -hmm. And it was, there was a situation between, so at Southampton, there was North Southampton, which trained out of Bath, and there was Southampton that trained at their club down in Southampton. And they had two academy centers. They were allowed that because they were on the coast and they could be two hours north. Um, in terms of travel so they had this other bath center and and there was no love lost between the two centers right um, and it was obvious that jago was leading the march from bath into southampton and, right. and that wasn't appreciated um and so it became it became almost non-viable, but it showed the worst of what it was. It was, it was political, rather with a small p, rather than genuinely about talent or whatever. We felt those people at Southampton might might look look differently at this, but that's how we perceive what was going on. Um, and so that that was an incredible, and and it and it became, honestly, it became so difficult at the end you know the things that jago was enduring age 12 no person should really go through and he was being expected to endure them age 12 and that really is really difficult as a parent to hear what he was right. to listen to and what he was being told and the way he was verbally being abused really okay. that was, really tough. was that by the coaching staff was that by teammates or who was that generally all coming Yeah, from? so by by a particular character on the staff right. yeah, who is no longer there. Yeah. Um, when we he was then released and when, when he came out of it, it was an amazing situation because I, I was being rung up. I don't know how people find your numbers. I don't know how this works, but... Oh, you'd be surprised. <laughs> by clubs all over England right. and, and Wales and... We're really interested in Jago. We've heard he's been moved from Southampton. I got a dozen calls. And I was I was at a stage that were um that's very nice of you to ring me. Can you ring me again in September? And she said, Well, we need to move really fast and all that kind of stuff. If you push me, the answer's no. Right. Uh, you know, we need a break from all of this. We cannot be here right. in amongst this thing. We have to have a break. We are breaking until September. You come back to or August it would have been, sorry. August. Come back okay. to it in August because we just right. need the time now to just regroup as a family because the, the situation right right so, so it's important yeah um so we did that and and um we then a, a, a friend 
told us about a chap called Tim Kirk, um, who then went on. Where was he coaching recently? He's at Borussia Dortmund. Borussia Dortmund, yeah. He's the academy manager at Borussia Dortmund now. Um, but he ran a thing called um, Bath and... What was it called, Jago? Bath and Wilts. Bath and Wilts, which was run as a charity. And, and their tagline was, it's not all about the ball. It's not all about the ball. And, and they were not an academy, not even a private academy. They were run by this amazing guy and a real visionary where come and play football with us. You'll play at high standard, but you will also learn about life and travel and all this kind of stuff. And that really helped us as a family fall back in love with football and Jago's dream. And to be honest, I think probably you, Jago, probably the same. You fell back in love with football. Yeah, it was the best thing that break and playing for Bristol City, uh, playing for um, Bath and Wilkes was the best thing I think that we could have done then. Um, yeah, a hundred percent. And then I, ironically, I then got scouted playing for Bath and Wilkes again, so I got double scouted by Bristol City. Yeah. And what you know, you know, when you joined them, um, Jago, right? Um, I just have a question. So when you were scouted by them, um, or you kind of went there. How did you find it when you were being released? And obviously, your dad's explaining from his perspective on how challenging he found it. How did you? How did you find it? What, 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 how did you process being released and facing that kind of adversity? Yeah, I mean, it's it's the worst. Is uh, it's the worst thing that I'd experienced at twelve, at age twelve, of course. I mean, I, that was like my dream had come crashing down. Um, I've only lived my dream for two years. I'd only been a signed player for two years. Um, and then it just came crashing down. But in some ways, I did expect it because the coach was just pretty, made it pretty obvious. And even as a 12 year old, I knew that he didn't want me at the club. Right. Uh, so I expected it. Um, and I think socially it was difficult because I'd just gone in. Um, to secondary school, and I'd sort of, as as a, every twelve year old did, you just want to fit in, and um, I sort of used the fact that I was an academy footballer to go and fit in and be the cool kid at school, um, and then that came away, and you know people looked at you different and said things differently to me, and um, I found mm. that difficult as well, um, mm. but I would say that. Uh, being released in Bristol City in March of last year was harder. Um, right. And I guess we'll come to that later, but... Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. So, so how did it make you feel, like, in terms of emotionally, mentally? Um, take us kind of through that, because I know, like, with uh, with um, mental health and, and stuff like that being important and certain kids can take it harder, what, what kind of were the kind of how did, how did it make you feel kind of mentally and emotionally and how did you deal with it um i don't mean really, i mean it's so long ago i think i i remember dad got the phone call and the coach said to dad that he was going to drive up to our house and have a coat didn't he say that dad he was going to have a meeting with us at the house mm. And then that never came about. And I remember me and dad went for a walk. And I just... Dad was angry. I remember dad being angry. And I think it was the first time I'd ever heard dad swear. Don't you remember dad? He was like... He, the first time he'd ever said it, a swear word mm. in front of me. And I, I remember being... Just... I don't remember being as upset as dad. I think I was just... Mm. Like... Just... I didn't feel anything and um and then over it like it just took it just took time especially with confidence um on the pitch it's probably taken me till now to be honest mm. to feel fully confident in myself as a player because he was on at me all the time um and the release of course about like not being good enough to play and I had a bit of imposter syndrome probably my whole time at Bristol City and it probably haunted my whole time at Bristol City. Um, I think so. Um, and it's probably only now that 
that I've got over that. Or I hope so. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely, man. I appreciate you being honest and, and vulnerable and, and I think that is I think that is important. I think it's important for players to talk about that. I think it's very important for sure. One hundred percent. I mean, um, you know, it, it's it's really, really interesting when I hear this because I I think as a kid, you know what I mean, I, I was quite lucky. I had I had some really good coaches. I mean, I remember I had I had Eddie Coulter, he had brought over Johnny Evans, he brought over David Healy, he brought over some really, really top top players and and but the thing is, he was all there was always an encouragement. But I, I think the only negative experience I had with Jim Ryan, uh, who was he didn't like Catholics basically. Um, and uh, remember him saying to me once, he said, "If you're a Protestant, that would you wouldn't have done, you wouldn't have moved the ball like that." And I thought, what does your religion have to do with yeah, anything? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I thought, oh, well, that's totally ridiculous. You know what I mean? So I know it. You know, some and but some of these people um, um, that are that are maybe in clubs. But I always say that football is never going to be fair because you're going to have people they might look at you. Um, you know what I mean? But I think at the same time, it's being able to deal with that. Yeah. Even when you're even when you're a kid. But I do think it's important, and I would be with your dad here on this. That a kid needs to be in a position where he's having to um, where you're learning the you're not you're not a first year pro i remember having this this conversation with stevie robinson at the irish fa who was the motherwell manager and i said stevie i said imagine i'm 12 and teach me something and i said stevie i said i'm 12 no but Nick, i said you're speaking to me like i'm a first year pro <laughs> i yeah. says i'm 12 that's the way you need to envision me because i'm looking through the eyes of a child um, to see how can I get the information across them, how can I build them up like for example one of the things that I would always say when I would coach I would say I would say a kid would make a mistake and they'd be beating themselves up and I would say you know what everybody makes mistakes because when I tell that child that, that exact thing they learn acceptance they learn it's okay to feel and that's one of the things I, I do love about capitalism as well is that you can feel and it's okay it's totally cool no problem so, um, and, and that I think, like what you're saying, but when you're at a young age, <laughs> you don't think that way. <laughs>